Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I want to go over what I think is commonly missed off either your drawings or the reports or basically any information that you send out. So the first one on the list, and the list is in no particular order, is roof straps. Generally, roof straps are something the roofing contractor is going to specify and detail and provide. So it's not something which you will normally have to worry about. But as you gain more experience and work on more and more projects, you'll realise that not all contractors are the same. Some are competent, some are good, some are bad, some are not very competent. Which is why if ever I have a timber roof structure, be it timber cut or roof trusses, I will always specify roof straps. And there are basically two types of roof straps which you'll need to consider. The first one is holding down straps and the other is lateral restraint straps. Restraint straps are there to essentially tie the roof structure to the wall and very commonly the walls, especially in the UK, are going to be made out of masonry like block work or brickwork. This is a recent video which has been going around LinkedIn and essentially this is a wall which has basically just fallen over because of the lack of restraint. So you can see why providing restraint to the wall is really really important. The other strap which I mentioned is holding down straps and these are essentially to prevent the roof from lifting off due to wind uplift. Wind causes uplift and timber being very very lightweight doesn't go well with resisting uplift forces which is why you need to provide these holding down straps to prevent the roof from just lifting off due to these uplift forces caused by wind loads. Whilst this is easily missed off your drawings, it's just as easy to add to the drawing and you can basically cover your own ass by just providing a simple note on your drawing. If I'm specifying a timber cut roof, so not a roof truss, I'll probably add on the centres of the roof straps which I'm going to be providing. But what I'm trying to get to is it doesn't take much just to cover yourself, so just a simple note is going to save you a lot of headache in the future. So the next one on the list is disproportionate collapse. And the problem with disproportionate collapse is sometimes it's just not thought about early enough in the project. Depending on which disproportionate collapse class the building is can have a massive impact on the structural solution that you go for simply because the tying requirements or the detailing can be significantly different between the different classes. I have personally experienced it on a project where a building was classed as 2B and that completely changed the structural framing from what would have been a simple masonry load-bearing structure to a concrete frame because the contractor simply didn't want to have to deal with or construct the really hard um, tying requirements needed for dealing with class 2B in a masonry structure. Whilst changing from class 2A to class 2B in a steel or a concrete frame building isn't very much of a problem. If it was timber or masonry, it can be a real pain to sort of iron out the details afterwards if you haven't thought about it early enough. If you're unsure as to what disproportionate collapse is, I've done a video recently talking about it. I'll leave a link to the video in the description below. The bottom line is, get the class sorted early on and then you're good to go. Next we have fire protection. And whilst as a structure engineer, we're not gonna be getting involved with sort of designing escape routes or escape plans, that's gonna be down to the sort of fire consultant. We are going to be responsible for providing a building or a structure that meets certain fire resistance requirements. And this could be as simple as providing a paint specification for steel work or providing adequate amount of cover to reinforce concrete. I think one of the first things which you need to do when you start a brand new project is to find out what the minimum fire resistance period is. And this is going to be dependent on the usage and also the height of the building. The reason why it's so important to work out what the minimum fire resistant period is early on because it can have an effect on the structural size of your members. An example of this would be a concrete frame building with a basement and in a basement the concrete structure is going to be exposed and if your concrete structure is say too small, say your columns are undersized, it may not meet the requirements for the required fire resistance. It's not necessarily something which comes up very, very often, but I have experienced it, not personally, but other people who I've worked with, who have had to sort of go back and recheck or come up with a different solution because they have undersized the concrete structure because it didn't meet the fire resistance period. It's such an easy check that you can find it in the red book based on its height and the usage of the building. 
that it literally takes less than a minute just to work out and then you can size your structure accordingly. So next we've got foundations in shrinkable soils and this can be a huge, huge problem if you don't catch it early. And the problems that can arise from not designing or not detailing your foundations to account for shrinkable soils can be, say, huge cracks in the elevation of your walls or significant amounts of movement. Seasonal movements of the soils caused by, say, nearby trees absorbing water at different rates can cause the soils to either expand or contract. This is actually quite a complex topic and I suggest you read up further on it. NHBC part four is a really, really good read if you need some sort of quick and easy references for foundation design to heavable soils. Not all soils will heave the same and it's gonna be down to the lab testing of the soil samples conducted by whoever's doing your ground investigation to determine whether or not the soils are gonna be high, medium or low volume change potential. The depth of foundation is going to be driven by a few factors. First of all, it's going to be down to the volume change potential of the soil and also the type of tree and also the proximity of the tree to your structure. Different trees have different water demands, which is why knowing the species of the tree is also really, really important. So when you're about to scheme or design your foundations, don't just look at the allowable bearing pressure given to you in your ground investigation report. It's really, really important that you understand what the soil type is in the ground and what the volume change potential is and if there are any trees nearby. Lastly, we have movement joints and movement joints are something which is often forgotten or not thought about until the very, very end. Not allowing for any movement can be very, very costly to remediate. The two most common types of movement, which I think is most commonly missed off, is gonna be movement in sort of brickwork or masonry and in concrete slabs. Movement joints in masonry or brickwork is really, really important because masonry expands and contracts. The rate of expansion varies between the materials, so brickwork will expand differently to say blockwork. What's also gonna be a driving factor is whether or not the masonry is gonna be externally exposed or if it's gonna be internal. External masonry is going to expand and contract more than if it was an internal environment due to the weather. If you have movement joints in your external brickwork, you generally want to hide it behind, say, rainwater pipes because movement joints don't exactly look very good. Engineers sometimes forget that just because masonry is internal doesn't mean that you can neglect adding in movement joints. If you have a long stretch of masonry, even if it's internal, you will need to provide a movement joint because the internal stresses that can build up within a long panel of masonry can really, really build up. And basically to relieve that stress, a crack is gonna have to form. I highly suggest reading up further on this topic. It's a bit of a dark art, but it's also really, really important. I highly suggest the Brick Development Association for some quick reading. I'll leave a link to their documents in the description below. So now moving on to joints in concrete slabs, I'm just gonna to touch on some of the most common types of joints which you might come across. So firstly, you've got something which we call a day joint, and it's also kind of known as a saw cut joint or a construction joint. These are joints which can be saw cut shortly after casting your concrete, and it's quite important that you put the spacings on your drawings. Another type of joint is called an isolation joint, and basically an isolation joint has free translation and free rotation in all directions. Next we have contraction joints and there are quite a few different types of contraction joints. Contraction joints can be untied or tied or you can have them say in a debonded sleeve. Each of these joints have their own types of uses so it's really important to understand each type of joint and understand the problem so that you can specify the right type of joint. I may do a video in the future which goes into more detail about concrete joints and slabs because it's quite a big topic and it's really, really important. In the meantime, if you wanna do some further reading, I highly suggest the Syria document, 146, joints in concrete structures, if you want some further understanding in the meantime. Concrete joints are easily missed out and forgotten about and the consequences can be some very, very unsightly cracks. Worse still is if you've got a water retaining structure such as like basement walls and slabs. If you don't design for movement and cracking, this can seriously impair your defense against water penetration in your concrete structure. To remediate this kind of problem is extremely difficult and costly, so make sure that you get it right from the onset. Hopefully you found this video useful. 
I'll leave in the video description of all the documents which I've mentioned and if I've forgotten any documents to say I'll list them out as well for some further reading. If you've enjoyed this video please remember to like and subscribe and I'll catch you in the next video. Cheers!